Thank you. I want to talk about data lineage. Well, data lineage is a very enterprisey subject. Normally, well, I was first confronted with that subject when I was working in a bank some years ago, and it was usually something that would be brought up by enterprise architects in a big diagram with many scary boxes and arrows. This is not so much a story about the boxes and arrows, but more what is behind it, and also the story of one of those rabbit holes that I found myself in, where I wanted to find out how some things actually work. My name is Helmar. I'm a sales engineer at Imply. I come from Munich, flew in. I'm, I feel honored and humbled to be a speaker at this conference. Uh, the company Imply is the main sponsor behind the open source project Apache Druid, of which more later. I sometimes blog about Druid in my free time. If you go to this uh, QR code, this takes you to my blog, and there are more rabbit holes. But about the subject, so data lineage is a um, subdivision of uh, the general subject of data governance, and uh, I am going to talk a little bit about data governance in, in general, but then I'm going to go right into the weeds and I'm going to talk about how to track data lineage in a streaming analytics pipeline. A streaming analytics pipeline is something where you have events coming in, and we have had a lot of talks uh, today already about how you do, how you stream events with Kafka, how you process events with Flinks. So I will touch upon all these things, but I will not do them in all breadths because other talks are covering, covering that. I'm going to talk about how you actually do something with the data that you have in these streaming pipelines. You want to visualize these data. You want to slice and dice the data. You want to gain analytic insights. And you do that with Apache Druid. And uh, I am going to show how to connect the bits, how to generate events, how to track where these events are coming from, how they have been processed. And I'm going to do that with aircraft radar data, because that is something that each of you could do themselves at home with a Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to demonstrate all this live, or at least I hope so, if the demo gods are with me. So, to go into it, data governance is a collection of standards, processes, rules, and met metrics, yada, 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 enterprise architect stuff. So it makes data usable, accessible, and effective, and it has three main areas. Data quality, so in this case, stream quality. Second is data catalog, stream catalog. Has also been handled um, in great detail by other speakers. Stream lineage, and that is how do you really track where is data coming from, how has it been processed. So basically, it's, you do tag markers to your data so that you can create a, an entire audit trail. And I'm going to look into the basics of that. With, at, at the example of a streaming analytics pipeline that is based on Kafka, so here, Kafka as the event streaming platform, data is going to be pre-processed, and you can do a lot of things here. I'll just do some very simple stuff with Flink, and then it's landed into Druid as an event streaming database. What are we going to do? Well. I already hinted at it. You want to tag your data. So you basically attach metadata thingies to your data. How do you do that in Kafka? Well, there is a... No, let's, let me put, the, put it that way. We usually imagine, if some, some of you, most of you probably know about Kafka, and what we imagine is Kafka messages, Kafka records, they have a key and a value, and then they have a timestamp, and then that's that. A lesser known feature are Kafka headers, and these Kafka headers are basically key value pairs that you can attach to any Kafka message, and then they are passed through. So, really nice thing, because that means you can track whatever you want uh, in those metadata without clobbering the actual data. 
And that is what we are going to do today. It turns out you can supply your own headers. They are key value pairs. They're basically just sets of bytes, Java strings. Um, you can put these headers into Flink. And uh, in Flink SQL, you would um, model this as a column that is also labeled metadata. Uh, you have to add a little bit code there if you really want to do something to those uh, headers. Because um, they are, by Flink, they are just viewed as bytes. So you need to manually encode and decode these if you, if you want to really interpret them as strings. And, and that is the nice thing about Druid, Druid can also read those metadata fields and process them very, very effortlessly. And I'm going to show all that. So this is how it looks in Flink. You have your Kafka headers. It's a map from byte to byte declared as a metadata column. Um, metadata in Flink, they have... Uh, there are specific tags, so when you let's say here from headers, uh, this is one of them. You can get metadata from the timestamp, from the headers, from anything in there. Um, metadata columns can be read-write or they can be read-only. It's a trap for the unwary. Um, if you want to declare a read-only metadata column, you would um, make this uh, a virtual metadata column. For instance, the partition in Kafka would be a virtual metadata column because you can only read it, you cannot write it. And then you have a different schema upon reading and writing. It's very interesting, it's quite, a, quite a rabbit hole. Anyway, so then we are, we are pre-processing data in Kafka, then we are landing them in Druid. Why Druid? Why would you want to have a streaming analytics database? Well, first of all, you want to be able to query your data. If you query a stream, we just learned in the previous talk over there in the other room, we learned about Flink SQL. You can query a stream in Flink. You create another stream, right? But what uh, Timo also said was that Flink doesn't really have a facility to land and store these data. You have, it connects to a connector, any connector. And usually you would write into another Kafka stream. And then the next time you run another query, you would create another stream. If you want to interactively explore your data, like what, 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 what this animation does. Yeah? You, you, you see something, you see a peak in your data, you zoom into it, you bring in other fields, uh, and with that, you pinpoint the, the cause of that, of, of that peak. When you want to do that, you need to have something that is a fully indexed, laid out version of your data. You want to be able to query this data really quickly so that it becomes a smooth process to analyze. You get into a conversation with your data. Um, you want to support high concurrency. Why is that? It's because you want to democratize analytics. You don't want to just have a small analytics team that is uh, the keeper of the grail. You may want to build an external application where you make analytics available to your own customers. And you want to, to, you want to analyze up-to-date data, but also historical data. And all this, these three points, these make the strengths of Druid. Apache Druid has been around for 12, 13 years now. It came out of an ad tech company. Uh, they had lots of clickstream and ad bidding data to analyze, and they wanted to know what is going on with my campaign right now. Because if you run an ad campaign, you may be burning a lot of money. If you don't have success immediately, you want to reallocate that budget. But there are many other use cases. Uh, Netflix is one big user. Uh, Confluent who I have had several talks here at the, at the conference. Confluent is using Druid technology to analyze the performance of their own Kafka clusters. So, really cool technology. How does it work? Um, you've got data coming into a cluster. You are running data ingestion and data query at the same time. Uh, for data ingestion, so here to the left is your Kafka stream, for instance. The Kafka stream has partitions. You have indexer processes that listen to these partitions, and they subscribe to these partitions and get any data immediately in. There is not a specific connector. It is a native connection. It guarantees exactly one's ingestion, and it is really written for Kafka, which is why it can do things like analyze metadata and everything else 
effortlessly. It builds so-called segments by, first of all, um, ordering the messages by time, partitioning them by time, and keeping these messages in memory in a row-based format up uh, until a, a, a certain target size has been reached. Once this target size has been reached, then the messages are transformed into a so-called segment format. These are these little boxes. Uh, the boxes also hint at what is happening here. Data is, because it's event data, it has a timestamp, right? So it is ordered by time. It is columnarized. Each column is represented by a data dictionary, and each column also gets a bitmap index. Why a bitmap index? Well, various reasons. First of all, it means that such a segment is fully self-contained because bitmap indexes can be stored together with the data. Second, you have very, very fast lookups. Also, the bitmap index is sorted, so you can have very fast range look lookups, and you can com combine multiple index very, very quickly. So, these data are then elastically brought to object storage object storage as an archive of all data that you have ever seen. And from there, they are brought back to the data servers into local cache, local N NVMe disks, typically, so that these data can then be queried. So if a query goes to the guy here at the top, the query broker, the query broker analyzes the query, finds out which segments it needs to interrogate, and generates partial queries. It sends these partial queries to the historical processes, also to the indexer processes, brings the partial results back, applies aggregations, returns, within fractions of a second, returns the result to the caller. All these components scale independently, and um, there are organizations that are running Druid on thousands of CPUs. So, Druid is a, a crucial component of this streaming analytics architecture. And now we need to stream in some data. What kind of data are we going to use? Well, you, I could use a data simulator, but I found that quite kind of boring. So actually what I did is, what probably many people have done, you take a Raspberry Pi, and a fairly small one is actually good enough. I think I am running a 2B model here. Um, and you put on a DVB-T DVB stick, basically a digital TV stick. What this thing does is it has a software-defined radio, and um, this software-defined radio can actually receive not only TV, but it can receive 1090 megahertz, which is where all the commercial aircraft and also most, most other aircraft, also private aircraft and so on, constantly send their data where they are, about their whereabouts, their position, their altitude, their call sign, and many things. It's publicly available data. You can contribute these data also to public services. Um, and it's nice to experiment with those data. What I've done is I've built this for myself. I've also shared the same with some of my colleagues. And then I've done some nice things. So uh, this service makes data available on a, on a specific port here, this one. Uh, I send these data to Kafka. And then I add Kafka headers, and this is, these are these lines here. So I, I, I give a unique client ID, which is my name or something. I also give my position, longitude and latitude. And then I send this. And all the other colleagues, they also do that, but they do their, their own coordinates and their own unique ID. So let's put all this together. We have the Raspberry Pi here. It sends data to Kafka. Well, this is a Kafka in the cloud, so all my colleagues can send to there as well. From Kafka, so what I have here is semi-structured data, and that is also kind of a hassle. So what I'm doing here, I do a very, very simple flink transformation, where I transform these data, which are like some kind of CSV-ish format, into a um, canonical JSON, if you will, and then I load these data into Druid, and then I've got some dashboards. So, let's see if we can get this to work. Whoops. So, 
first step is to build, to load data into Flink. Now this data is in my cloud Kafka, and what I'm doing is I use, I, I use a create table statement in Flink, which has this one here. Can you read this from down, from down there, or should I make it bigger? I make it bigger. Yeah, it's 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 not com not command plus. It's command dot for some reason in this. Uh, wrong. So. So I'm I'm, crea I'm I'm creating a Flink table on top of my data, but the data is unstructured. So what I have here is I only have a Kafka key and a Kafka value field. I don't I have I don't have more information about the structure of the data. I'm also reading the Kafka timestamp and I'm reading the Kafka headers. So let's do that. So I take this, I copy this into my Flink client which is here in a Docker container. And this, does, this hasn't actually started a job. It basically tells Flink how to interpret data that it's going to read from Kafka. In order to actually read from Kafka, I do this one here. Select star from ADSB raw. So let's do that. And then you see what I meant. It takes a moment. And then it will update the data. And I've got my Kafka timestamp. I, I can read it. I've also got my Kafka key and my Kafka message. This is all clear text. But the Kafka headers, there is there are some hex code. It's just bytes. Yeah? So it doesn't really know a lot about that. But I can still pass these data through. And I can create my own structured stream. So and here is another thing to, to consider. Because my data is kind of CSV-ish, but it's not always the same number of fields. So CSV is a bit tricky. So uh, I could do a CSV reader in Flink, but that is a bit brittle, and it doesn't really work well with uh, changing number of fields. It will, it will crash at some point. So instead, I do the following. So I create a table with all the fields that I know will be in, in there. So here is my field declaration with all the fields that I have in my Kafka topic. That, again, is just a table definition. The real job is then done by the next statement. And here I really, uh, I really extract every single bit, bit by bit, by position, split index with the separator, the comma, and then the field position. I pull out all my fields. That is very robust, and it works very well. So here we go. And I think I can probably do something like select star. But let's just use, let's just take a few fields. So now you can already see it here. We have got all the fields, and each field has been put nicely and neatly into its own column. Time to pass data on to Druid. So now we are, build, we are building a, type, a pipeline. We are in business. This is good. I'll go to the Druid console. This is open source Druid. There is a cloud service by Imply that makes these things even easier. So let's load some data. I have now pushed data to local Kafka. This runs here on my laptop and Docker. So I am configuring a streaming ingestion. I get my data from Kafka. The 
host name inside the Docker container is just Kafka, so I'll, I'll do Kafka 1992. Topic is ADSB JSON. And here you can already see we've got all the metadata in there. It has nicely parsed not only the, the, the timestamp and topic, but also all the headers. It has already interpreted them. So I'm, I'm able to track my data lineage. I can see for each row of data where it came from. Now let's build our schema for real. I need to find a timestamp. It has here. And you can see that here, parse Kafka metadata. This is by default enabled. It parses all the metadata. It gets everything out of the Kafka topic. So it will now use the Kafka timestamp. I could use a different one, but let's just use the Kafka timestamp for now. And then it's about getting the data out of the rest of the fields. So this is configuring the schema. And here I am. Now I'm basically good to go. Um, I mentioned that I have to define the segment target size. I do this here, so I'm, I say I'm going to build daily segments with a default size. And I'm reading from the beginning of the topic, why not? And then I give this the name, this is the table name. So, and hit submit. And if I've done everything right, then it should start. Yeah, and there is my task, and it's, it's reading data. Now I can go to the schema, and I have my data here. So let's look into the table, select star. It's all standard SQL. It's pretty cool. Here's my data, and if you scroll a bit, you would see where the data is coming from here, the Kafka header client ID. I can do things like Kafka header client ID. I want to group by that. Let's see which client IDs I have. And the count star. Group by first column. There we are. So, this is me. This was an error in configuration. This is, ah, this is you. This is also you. And this is Peter. Yeah, so they sit in the UK. Um, I have, because as usual, I don't trust my demo to do it live, I also have a prepared if a table with some more data, which has all this stuff in the cloud, so it's pulling this down here. And this connects to a nice little dashboard here where you can see all these things in Grafana. So, oh, it has actually added some data. So you can see here where my colleagues are located with their data. So. Most of them, no, all of them except me, are in the UK. I'm, in the, I'm here near Munich. And here I've selected one specific air, aircraft ID that I, well, I prepared that, obviously. And why it's not there? Now, no, there it is. So what you can see here, ah, it is in dark mode. It, it doesn't come out so nicely. But um, there is a small airfield for private aircraft, which is next to the town where I live. And there people do these kind of little loops. So, what have we done? We, are, well, we, actually, we actually see, here, you can see here where all these aircraft data came from. And I could now filter by the aircraft data. I've actually done this, I've, I've also prepared this in one view in Imply's own front end, which you can see here. There's another dashboard. Here's again the little town next to where I live. Here, I don't know if you can see it. It's probably ca you cannot see it. Here's the little airfield, and here are all the private aircraft that are going on. Now, with this client, I can also do things like, oh, let's look at the data. Let's break down how many of, the, of those 
aircraft count came from each of the clients. So I've got my metadata in here as a column. I break this down. And now I see only myself. Why is that? Uh, I think it's because of, of the dashboard. So let's just go back to the cube definition. Client ID. Here they are all. They, they are all. So let's. Ah, I had, a, I had a filter in there. I know where I know with it, what, what, I did, what that was. So, and here you can see that this young gentleman, because he is somewhere near Heathrow, he has way more records of data. So you can immediately see, and you can filter by each of those uh, data points. Oh, let's put, a, let's put in the um, street map here. Split on longitude and latitude. And now, if I filter by a specific client ID, say I want Hugh's data, then I can see he has been receiving data from mostly around London. Now, for me, this is a nice experiment. It was learning something about technology, but tying back into the subject of the talk, what this enables you to do is establishing a chain of custody by adding metadata to each record in Kafka, passing these metadata through in Flink, you can also add more tags to document what you have been processing in Flink. And um, with a Kafka Flink Druid stack, you have all the tooling to process the metadata as first-class citizens. So I hope I've brought down a enterprise architecture te theme to really technical basics that everybody can try out at home. And you are, of course, all invited to do this and play with aircraft data at home. It's really easy. It's really fun. Um, if you are interested in Druid, here are some more resources. The right one is uh, a uh, community link that is uh, maintained by some of my colleagues. It's a set of, uh, well, it's basically a, a complete coursework based on Python notebooks where you can learn how to use Druid with various kinds of data in real time and in batch scenarios. It's really cool. Um, if you want to try out Druid as a fully managed cloud service, you can use the left link that is Imply Polaris. And if you want to know more, next week there will be a Kafka Flink Druid meetup in Berlin hosted by the wonderful folks at Remerge, which is an ad tech company that is very close to the central station in Berlin. They are really awesome. Um, some of my colleagues from the UK will be speaking there, and that is coming Monday, exactly one week from now. Uh, I'll share my, my slides later. So if you're interested, here are some more resources. And with that, I say thank you, and I'm open for questions. Um, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, I didn't realize, also for what do you need Flink in this setup? Also couldn't you have um, used this Kafka topic directly in Druid?
If not, you can use the microphone. Ah, it's okay. Yeah, so um, the usage of Flink here is not strictly necessary. I could also ins ingest CSV data directly into Druid, that's right. What I wanted to show is uh, how to pick up the metadata from Kafka, how to pass them through Flink processing, even if the Flink processing here is just a reformatting under the hood. But I also generate, um, that's, that's another thing. Um, before Flink, in this case, I have a semi-structured -structure, format. I don't have a strict schema, I don't have a strict data contract. After it, I have a strict data contract. Um, that becomes more interesting even if you are going to use, um, which I'm not doing here because this is all open source components so you can try it out at home. But if you're using Confluence Flink, it's very closely integrated with that schema registry. And um, then you want as a first step, because what Confluent Flink does is, uh, it will, when you enable it, it will create a Flink table on top of every topic that you have in your Kafka or in your, in your Confluent Cloud. And uh, if you don't have schema registry, if you don't have a schema on that topic, then you have only key and value. You, you have no idea, Flink has no idea what is in the value. So you need this first step where you manually pick apart the things that are in the value and then push your data on into a topic that is schema registry enabled. So that was the story behind it. The other thing is, uh, if you do some complex processing, you can do so, absolutely, but then it would be another talk. Any other questions? If not, then thank you for that interesting presentation, Helma. Thank you for having me. <laughs>